So before I go right back to where we were yesterday, let me point out something important. The purpose of this discussion is for you to be able to create a differential equation and to then, from a differential equation, create a function. This process is not the only way this is done, but this is why calculus and physics were put together. This is why Newton needed calculus at the same time he was doing physics. And this is what you paid for to be here. This is where we actually leave AP Physics 1. I mean, you guys have been in, AP, in this class for a while, but we have really not done anything more than AP Physics 1. I mean, yeah, the problems are harder, but trust me, I'm teaching AP Physics 1 the same stuff right now, and I could use the same examples. And yeah, some of ours are more complicated, but they're not different. This is different. This is new. Now, there is something qualitative about this that I think is lost on students. Let's assume I have a ball and I throw the ball upwards into the air. So this is the direction of its velocity. Now, when the ball is traveling upwards, if there's no air resistance, we've just assumed the ball will, by the force of gravity, be brought to rest. And then we'll repeat the same journey back downwards. But that's not really what happens. When the ball is thrown upwards, it definitely has gravity acting downwards on it. But there's also a drag force. The first thing I want you to really understand about the drag force is that the drag force is velocity dependent. Now, keep that in mind because that's an important detail. The drag force is in the opposite direction of the velocity. So, on the way up, the two forces are acting on it to slow it down. But on the way down, when it has changed direction and it's on its way down, weight will still be downwards. It will not have changed, but now the drag force will have changed direction. And eventually, the ball will actually make it to a constant velocity. It will reach terminal velocity on the way down. It doesn't reach terminal velocity on the way up because it's always slowing down on the way up. It starts at its fastest and the entire time its velocity is decreasing because there's an unbalanced net force downwards. But on the way down, it could reach the steady state condition. Steady state means unchanging where the drag force equals the weight and from that point forward, it has a constant velocity, which means it takes stuff longer to come down than to go up. Do the math in your head. On the way up, you have two forces slowing it down to a stop. But on the way down, one force is bringing it down. One force is trying to prevent it from coming down. It's going to take longer to come down. This is why, and you've probably never noticed this, but last year we did a lab in this class. I say we, you didn't. But when we did, we had a car on a track. We rolled the cart up the track and measured its velocity on the way up and on the way down. And I said, find the acceleration of the cart because it's got to be a, you know, it's got to be whatever the, the inclination of the cart. This year we're going to do it again, and you're going to be able to clearly see that there's a break in the line at zero. The moment the cart stops and comes back down, its trip down has a different acceleration than its trip up. And that's directly attributed to the fact that there's a frictional force that acts on the way down that makes it take longer to come down than to go up. It's just the way it's going to be. These velocity-dependent forces are going to change a lot of the way we look at what happens to an object. You know, I was really surprised by the number of people who got the projectile problem wrong on the test. The one I had, something like that. And they asked about, I think it was uh, point Q and point P. They said, what was the acceleration at point Q? And you had to put an arrow. Of course it's downwards. Of course. And then they asked, what was the net force at point P? Of course it's downwards. Of course it is because the acceleration has to be in the direction of the net force. On the other hand, we start adding air resistance to this, and there's going to be a force that is now in the opposite direction of motion. 
The actual trajectory of a projectile is not easy to fully appreciate. When you get rid of air, sure, it's a parabola. We proved it. But the moment you add air resistance and this force is opposing the motion, I'm sorry, opposing the velocity of the object, that's going to significantly change what the trajectory looks like. I don't think we can come up with a function like we did for the trajectory without air resistance because I'm pretty sure it's going to look blunted at the end and not make it as high so that towards the end it will be coming straight down. Ever watch baseball? Mm -hmm. Towards the end, that ball is coming straight down when it's hit out in the outfield. They're barely moving. Well, this is why. It also affects golf balls this way. But the dimples on the golf ball can help it fly better. They're put there for a reason. In fact, a company... All right. So let's hit the math. Yesterday we got partway through this. Today we're going to finish. So we have weight down. Drag force up. Let's recall something about this. We dropped the object, right? We didn't throw this object up. We lifted it up and dropped it. At time equals zero, what was the velocity? Zero. zero. We dropped it from rest. Now, that meant that at the instant we dropped it, it was accelerating at G. However, it only took one instant for it to no longer have a zero velocity. And the moment it had a velocity, it was experiencing a drag force that was proportional to its velocity. I'm choosing this one today. We're gonna to look at this particular type of drag. But be aware, I could have said CV squared or CV cubed, who knows? I could, I could have made a complicated function of drag. We're just gonna do CV. Now, truthfully, I should write it like this. Right, it's a vector equation. Force of drag opposes the velocity. That's what it would look like as a vector equation. Something you should start to do is ask yourself, is that negative sign in front of a vector? If it is, it's about direction. It will help you if you think that way. Now, the first step when you're asked to create a differential equation, you'll need a method. There are about three methods that I'm going to teach students this year. And in mechanics, I'll probably only teach two of them. The first method is to use Newton's law. And the reason that method works is because acceleration is a differential. And to create a differential equation, we need an equation that is based on a differential. Newton's law has one baked right in. That's why it's one of the easiest places to start. The question will probably read something like, create but do not solve a differential equation that could be used to find the function of to find a velocity as a function of time. That's what it will sound like. Be, be cognizant. When they say velocity as a function of time, they are dictating this specific derivative. If they say position as a function of time, then they are saying this derivative. But they could just as easily ask for a differential equation that could be used to solve for velocity as a function of position, then the derivative you would be looking for would be this one. And we don't have an equation that has that baked in. So you need to listen to the, to the question carefully or, or read it if you're gonna be reading it. So the most likely statement is this one. That is the most likely one. It's the one that's asked the most on the exam. So, as you always know, I try to make the direction to be the same direction as the acceleration. So I'll make downwards positive, and I'll get mg minus cv equals ma. Now, they will give one point for recognizing that net force is the way to go here. They're going to give one point for successfully putting in all the things into your net force equation. But here's the clincher. To get the point that they're asking about, all you have to do is know that the acceleration is dv dt. That is what they are testing when they say create a differential equation. That's it. It's so simple, but that's almost always worth a point on its own. That's substitution. So any reference to that when you're given a derivative question like this, you should make that substitution. Now, that's a differential equation. And as differential equations go, there's a variety of ways it could be written. 
what you're seeing is the way I will almost always write it in class, just like that, with the differential as a differential form of the function. But be aware that in engineering, they'll write it like that. And they use the dot notation. Dot is with respect to time. Okay, dot notation is with respect to time. You can't write dvdx this way. But you can, anytime there's a dot, that means with respect to time. Right now, you are learning, right, prime notation. Be careful with that. That doesn't automatically mean with respect to time. That has other meanings. Your, lots of your derivatives are actually with respect to x, not with respect to time. So be careful. Prime is not considered standard outside of a calculus class. The dot notation means with respect to time. It is specific. So if you have V double dot, that is the second derivative with respect to time. I, I want to be very clear. Later on this year, we will have M dot. I won't use the dot notation. I'm just telling you that we will have situations where we have DM DT. That's how fast you consume fuel. So it's not a big deal. But if you're a rocket, your rocket has a change in mass. So remember, this could be our derivative later. So I want to be very careful that you understand that this prime notation doesn't exist outside of your calculus very much, but the dot notation does. And in engineering classes and your first year of college, they'll just assume you know the dot notation, even though it's not our curriculum at all. I'm going to focus on DVDT. I'm including the dot conversation because it's, I've talked to four or five students who are blindsided by it. And since many of you are gonna be engineers, I'm just gonna keep bringing it up a little at a time, okay? So let's get to the point now of solving this. This is not physics at this point, but it was created by a physicist. So it does have its roots in the idea that we want something from this. This would be the next part of the question. After it says something like, you know, create but do not solve a differential equation that could be used to find the velocity as a function of t, they might now say, find the velocity as a function of t. They might even give you what the answer is supposed to look like. They are looking for you to do the process. And there's a process here. And I'm going to teach you the process as a, function, as a series of steps. With step one, step one being to isolate your derivative. Isolate the differential. So that's not particularly hard in this case and won't be particularly hard in most cases. But you want to isolate your differential. Now, this process is called splitting the derivative or splitting your differential. So we're going to do exactly what it says. We're going to split the derivative. We're going to multiply both sides by the bottom of the derivative. In this case, dt. Oops. So that's step two, splitting the derivative. Now, this part is harder for students to understand. They have a difficult time with it. But the way this is going to work is we are going to integrate both sides of the equation the only way we can do that is if all variables related to the differential exist only on the side of the equation where their differential is, meaning dv means with respect to v. So I need to make sure anything that has v in it is on the same side as dv, while dt means with respect to t. So I need to make sure anything that has t in it is on the same side as dt. In most cases, that's gonna be really easy to do, but there are cases where it's hard, where maybe there's an interrelationship between V and T that makes it so it can't be split up. That requires a course in differential equations. There are methods for that. Ours are never gonna be that complicated. You will always be able to separate yours out. And there's only a few different types of functions, so it'll usually be nothing more than dividing one side of the equation by something. In this case, we're going to move the entire fraction over to the other side. There's no way to take just a piece of it. We have to take all of it. I can't tease out just the V. There's no way to do so. That DT is multiplying by everything there. 
so I can't tease the V out on its own. Now, what we have left is something that can use, be used to use your simple integral rules to solve. Meaning what I have now is something that I can take and apply the integral to both sides. Which is what we're going to do next. Now this part is, is not particularly hard unless you haven't done these kinds of integrals and then it can be. But this part is pure calculus, pure calculus. You will learn all the rules necessary in your calculus class to take this integral. But I don't wanna wait for this, all right? So we need to learn how to do it now because this is really where it fits well. So I'm gonna to go to another page and we're gonna talk a little bit about integrals for a minute as it pertains to this example. Okay? Now, before we start, I do this a little different than Mr. Bright and Mr. Brashear. They have their method that works for calculus AB and calculus BC. I have what I like to use in physics. They are very similar. They will apply boundary conditions after they take the indefinite integral. I like to apply my boundary conditions before I take the integral. It's just a difference in style. There's no actual difference in the work you'll have to do. But boundary conditions are the things we started with at the, at the beginning of this question. I asked you, how fast is it going when, at time zero when you release it? That's a boundary condition. That is establishing that at t equals zero, the velocity equals zero. Those boundary conditions are used to help us determine the limits of integration. For you guys who are new to this, we've done a little bit of limits because we've done a little bit of integration already. But the limits are numbers that are placed here. The bottom is, is where you start your integral. The top is where you end your integral. For example, I am trying to get a function for the velocity in terms of time. So I want my function to start at time zero. And I want to look at any other time in the future. So I want to integrate this from zero to t to some time in the future. I don't have to give it a definite answer. And I can reuse variable names here, even if that's confusing to you. Now, I could put capital T there if you really want me to, but I, I, I just don't do that because I'm not used to it. Now, on the other side, this is important. What I use on the other side has to match up. So meaning this bottom has to be the velocity that matches this bottom. So when you apply your boundary conditions, you need to be aware of what you're applying. So for us, we know that this has to be zero. And we are looking for the velocity at some future time. That means this is the velocity at time t. That's going to be our function. V is a function of t. If you're looking closely at this, you do realize the entire left side is going to produce a function that has just t in it. And the entire right side is going to produce a function that has just v in it. That will be v as a function of t. So the left side's easy. And we'll talk about the left side real quick. I am taking the integral from 0 to t of t to the 0 power dt. Now, you understand how incredibly explicit I'm being here, even though I don't want to be, because the answer is just t. But for the uninitiated, the antiderivative of t to the 0 power is t to the 0 plus 1. And then I take my new my new exponent and divide out my antiderivative by my new exponent. We've done this before, right? This isn't the first time I taught you to do this a couple months ago, and now you've already done this in calculus, so I know you know what we're talking about. However, to complete a definite integral, we have to make sure we're applying our boundary conditions. 
So this is actually going to produce t minus 0. Which is going to be t minus 0. New. You'll notice we've got a whole lot of crap over there, right? We're not going to be able to use any of those simple derivative rules we learned at the beginning of the year. We need an all new crappy rule to make this one work out. We're going to use something called u sub. And u sub, in the form that you BC kids are learning it, oh, it's just so mean. But for us, it's pretty easy. The idea behind u substitution is to substitute something in for your current function that is easier to integrate. That's the whole idea behind it. We want to put something in there that's easier. Now, what it almost always means for us is everything in the denominator is our u sub. Almost every time. Or everything that's in our sine function. It's almost every time that's what it's going to be. And that's what it's going to be this time. But here's how u sub works. You pick something in your function that you would like to substitute and make simpler. For example, I want to get rid of a constant minus a function and turn it into just a function. So I'm going to substitute in mg minus cv with u. Thus, u substitution. It doesn't have to be the letter u, by the way. They call it u sub, so u gets all the credit, but it could be b sub or d sub or j sub or theta sub. It doesn't matter. The u is just a temporary variable. It's just temporary. We're just going to use it. Dang. I'm in a mood today. It's just going to happen. Just throw it out there. I'll watch you guys. So the process is simple. Find something that you will use for your substitution. That's what I'm going to use. Then take the derivative with respect to that variable. So I want to take du dv. Well, that's pretty easy. It's minus C. Right? Mg is a constant. And then I just have C times V. So the derivative of C times V with respect to V is C. Right? V to the 1 power minus 1. Now, last step. Solve for dV. Now, look. I'm going to keep going for like 10 seconds. You're then going to substitute. Where I see mg minus cv, I put in u. Where I see dv, I put in du over negative c. Now cancel anything out that cancels and then pull all of your constants out of the integral. you'll get a simpler integral. Of course, the problem is you guys can't do this integral either, which is why we have to learn something else too. You have to learn that this is the natural log of you. But that's a story for Monday.